going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is our text for today. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you if you're at Sweetwater or at McCulloch Campus uh, and uh, turn to page 1,150. If you're at Parker joining us, then uh, there's a table in the back. You can grab one of the Bibles there. And, and for all of the campuses, if you're with us and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those home with you because we want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. And here at Calvary, we're all about life change. So we're continuing our next step series today. Uh, because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and by that we mean if you believe that Jesus is actually the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then, then you are called by God to take the next step. That, that, that's just part of this whole DNA of being a Jesus follower is to actually follow him. And if you're going to follow him, then he is always calling you to take that next step, that next step of faith, that next step of obedience, that next step. That you can't follow Jesus and stay where you are. It's impossible. And, and, and the apostle Peter put it to us in such a powerful way in 1 Peter chapter 2 when he said, For to this you have been called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. So if we're going to actively follow Jesus, if we're going to experience peace and joy, if we're going to grow spiritually, become mature followers of Jesus, then we must take a step of obedience. And that is a continual process our entire lives. That's what it means to be a follower, really. And today we're talking about what might be the biggest step for many followers of Jesus. This is probably the single biggest obstacle for many who, who love Jesus and want to follow Jesus, but they keep running into this, this obstacle that blocks their path, uh, and they need to overcome that. And, and that's why Jesus talked about it constantly. That's why the Apostle Paul addresses it directly in the text we're looking at. In case you haven't figured it out yet, we're talking about giving. We're talking about money. We're talking about generosity. And, and the Apostle Paul is very blunt. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, again, page 1150, uh, beginning at verse 6. He says, The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Uh, the Apostle Paul is, is kind of blunt there. He's kind of direct and his philosophy of giving. And I want to just be blunt about Calvary's philosophy on this matter. And I want to challenge you to take the next step on your journey as you follow Jesus. So if you're newer to Calvary, if you're checking us out, if you're wondering what we're really all about, I hope this helps you understand us better. Uh, if you've been around a while, this is a, a refresher. You've probably heard some of these things before, but we don't mind repeating them because some of us need to hear it again and again and again before we get it. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're looking in on us because uh, what we're talking about are the expectations of the followers of Jesus Christ to take that next step. And, and as we shared last week and the week before, uh, your next step, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, is to determine whether or not you're going to take that step of faith and confess Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Because we want you to, but that's the most important step you can take. Now, for all those in this room that have already taken that step, then Jesus is asking you to take that next step of faith, that next step of obedience. So, uh, Here's uh, our philosophy, if you will, about the next steps when it comes to giving and generosity and money. Uh, some things that all of us need to remember and frame this. First of all, 
God doesn't need your money. God does not need your money. God created everything that is. And the scriptures tell us repeatedly that God owns everything. I mean, he made it all. He owns it all. It's his. At the end, he's going to burn it all up and create it all over again. So God doesn't need anything. By definition, he's God, so he doesn't need it. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your praise. He doesn't need your, uh, you know, a company. He doesn't need anything. He's complete, and he's perfect. So if someone tells you that God needs your money, just not true. It's not true. A absolutely. A and, and because God doesn't need your money, the church doesn't need your money. I know. Some of you just gasped on the inside. You're like, did he really say that? There's a preacher. See, I'm, I'm kind of on TV, but not really. So that really is a shock. <laughs> now, our finance team doesn't really like it when I make this point very much, but I have to make this point. It's true. And, and, and I want you to understand why the church doesn't need your money. The church is the bride of Jesus. The Apostle Paul, in, in his letter to the church at Ephesus, he says, uh, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So the example for husbands to love their wives is how Jesus loved the church. So he's equating the relationship of Jesus to his church as husbands to wives. So uh, uh, let me just, let's just play a game here for a minute. If, if I'm wealthy, is my wife wealthy too? <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> If I have enough, does my wife have enough? Yes, she does. And, and if I'm any kind of a husband, I'm going to make sure she's taken care of. So if Jesus owns everything, because Jesus is God, if Jesus owns everything, he has plenty of resources, does his bride have plenty of resources too? Yeah, she does. He's going to take care of his bride. He loves her. He said, hey, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He sacrificed everything for her. So when people say that the church, you know, needs your money or this ministry needs your money or it's going to close, it really tells you what they think about God. And, and, and I'm sorry, I read the scriptures and, and, you know, here at Calvary, we believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. And, and so I read that and I go, no, Jesus is going to take care of the church. And, and so if a ministry is honoring God and if God is, is for it, it's going to be okay. So God doesn't need your money, and the church does not need your money. And some of you really like this sermon so far. <laughs> and here's the kicker. We need to give. We need to give. We need to give our money. We need to give our resources. We need to give our time and our talents to God. It is a desperate need for us to give these things to God. When I say we, I'm talking about Jesus followers. You've made that commitment to follow Jesus with your life. You've confessed Jesus as Lord. You believe that God raised him from the dead. Then you belong to him. And, and, and as a follower of Christ, you need to give. Now, if you're not a follower of Christ, uh, understand you don't need to give. But also understand that if you apply the, God's principles to your life, you're going to be blessed too. That's really how it works. And so we're going to just tell you right up front, we're, we're not looking for that. It's not expected from us. Uh, but if you feel like you want to give us something, we'll gladly receive that because we know God's going to bless you anyway. So I'm saying we need to give, and some of you are thinking, why do we need to give? I mean, really, honestly, why? If God has everything and church is his, and he's going to take care of it, why do we need to give? Uh, there's lots of reasons. Every one of them could be a sermon. I'm not going to preach on every one of them. But, uh, but we give to God because we are grateful for our salvation. Now, I want you to hear this. We don't give to God in order for him to save us. He doesn't need your money, but we need his grace. And, and so when we come to that place where we realize that we are loved by God and we are forgiven by God and heaven is our home because of the sacrifice of Jesus, it makes us grateful people. And grateful people are generous people. Generous people tend to be grateful, too. They, they just say it goes hand in hand because you understand that the blessings you have come from God and you understand the gifts that he's given you, uh, most importantly, salvation, but all the gifts of life are from him. And so you want to live in gratitude and so you are generous. You just freely share because you're grateful. 
And we give because we trust God. Because we trust God, what do we do? We follow his example. Uh, you think about this. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you. Because Jesus gave himself for you, leaving you an example that we should do what? Follow in his steps. We follow in his steps. So uh, when we understand that, when we understand that we want to follow Jesus' example, we, it, it's an act of trusting God. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but faith is kind of important to me. And it's kind of important to God. The writer of Hebrews actually says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And, and, and so we're talking about faith. This is a place of faith. We want to encourage you to have faith. But, but here's what I know. If, if you're a person of faith and you're following the example of Jesus and Jesus sacrificed everything for us, we're going to give back to God because that's the example and we trust him. We trust him to take care of us. We trust him to provide for us. And he's kind of asked us to do it. And, and then we give because we understand that we're stewards, not owners, but stewards of the possessions that we have that God has given to us, and, and God tells his stewards to be generous, to give. Now, maybe you don't think of yourself as a steward. Maybe you think, hey, it's my stuff. I bought it. I owned it. I got the title deed, all that kind of stuff. But let me just remind you that if you're a follower of Jesus, then that means Jesus is your, what, Lord. Lord is, is kind of a, like he's in charge and we're not. And we use terms like servants. We talked about that last week. It's one of those big obstacles that gets in the way is our attitude about serving. And, and, and so if Jesus is our Lord, he's our master, he's our boss, he's our king, then all the stuff we have belongs to him. See, some of us kind of, that grates on our soul right now. We're like, it's my stuff. No, if, if you belong to Jesus, then your stuff belongs to him too. By the way, he gave it to you, so, uh, you know, you ought to recognize where it came from. And, and so be, if you get that, then you go, I'm a steward of God, and God wants his stewards, his servants, to be generous, so I'm going to be generous because I understand that God gave it to me. And if you don't understand this, God can take it away from you too. There's a story in the Bible called Job. It's in the Old Testament. If you're not familiar with it, it's the one that spelled Job. And you look it up in the table of contents. Uh, it, it's a story that will freak you out uh, a little bit, so I'm just warning you. But it's, it, it's a story about how God gives and God takes away. His servants say he's blessed whether he gives or takes away. So uh, understanding that, that we're stewards, not owners, is a, is a big step. When we get that, we give. And then we give to God because when we give to God, it blesses us. Now, that sounds a little bit selfish, and, and I'm going to acknowledge that. Uh, it sounds selfish, but it's understanding what God's Word says and believing and applying it to your lives because living by God's wisdom has rewards. It's just going to be real blunt. If you live by God's wisdom, you're going to have rewards in your life. That's why we say this is the Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live our lives because if you live your life by it, it's going to bless you. So I want to call your attention back to what Paul said in verse 6. Because he, he's really blunt. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap, how? Sparingly, yeah. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap, yeah. So I, I know we don't you always use the word sparingly and bountifully. About, how, when was the last time you guys used the word bountiful? <laughs> right? I, I, I really haven't heard that word used a whole lot. So let's put it this way. Whoever's cheap isn't going to get much, and whoever's generous is going to get a lot. <laughs> isn't that what he's saying? Yeah. It sounds so religious. You sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. No, you, if you're cheap, you're not going to get much, and if you're generous, you're going to get a lot. <laughs> That's what he says. And and by the way, when Paul said this, it was not some theoretical moment in his writing to the church in Corinth. No, he, he said this when he was taking up an offering. Yeah, see, he was collecting an offering for the church in Jerusalem 
so he could take the money back because the church in Jerusalem was persecuted and, and they couldn't work and they couldn't buy stuff. And so he's like, I'm going to take money. I'm going to give it to the people there so that you know, they can continue doing their work in Jerusalem. We're going to help them out. Because, and he, he said this to the church in Corinth and it extends to us. He said, you wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. You wouldn't know the grace of God if it weren't for them. And, and, and that's reality and that ripple effect. So he's, he's telling the church at Corinth, hey, I'm coming there, and I'm going to take up an offering, and I want you to know this. Whoever's cheap isn't going to get much, but whoever's generous is going to be blessed like crazy. And when Paul is telling us this, uh, he's, he's referencing what Jesus taught in the Gospel of Luke. See, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus said, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, we put into your lap. That's a phrase about, you know, using grains and measurements and things like that. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, did you hear what Jesus said that Paul is referencing? I mean, seriously, did you actually hear what Jesus said? Because we're in church, and it's so really easy to kind of go, yeah, I heard, I heard. Jesus said, if you give, it will be given to you. For the measure you use, it's going to be measured back to you. Sounds like Paul when he says, if you're cheap, you're not going to get much, and if you're generous, you're going to get a lot. And, and, uh, and honestly, I grew up hearing that, but it didn't, it didn't resonate with me. It didn't make sense with me. I heard the words. I nodded my head. I went, oh, okay. Um, but some of us need help seeing it, visualizing it. So here is my illustration that helps me make sense of, of what Jesus is saying, what Paul is saying, and I want it to make sense to you guys, so I'm going to move this table so maybe it can make sense and they can see it on camera a little bit better. Okay, so inside my box, I have my illustration. And, uh, and what I want to do is just kind of point out what this looks like. I'm going to put this on the floor so you can see it better because you can't see what's in the box yet, right? I'll get to the box. Some of you are impatient, right? You want to see it now. Some of you have seen this, okay? I've shared this before. Some of you are like nodding your head like, oh yeah, I know this. Others of you haven't. But some of us need visuals so we can really understand the the truth of God. So let's just confess some things here. Like, first of all, I uh, have an addiction to ice cream, okay? Some of you know that. Some of you do not. I love ice cream, okay? I started working in ice cream stores as a a teenager, and, and, uh, and and people say, oh, you'll burn out on ice cream. It hasn't happened yet, Okay? Love ice cream. And let's just say that you invite me over to your house for ice cream. And, uh, and you say, Chad, I'm going to have your favorite ice cream, and, and you can have as much as you want. But I have this really weird thing about you can only get one serving of it. Hey, it's your house, your rules, right? It's God's world. God, God makes his rules, and we don't always understand them, but we live by them. And so you say, come over to my house, and oh, by the way, bring your own bowl. All right, uh, whatever. You're buying my favorite kind of ice cream. You can be weird. I'm show up. Let me tell you what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to show up with a bowl like this. <laughs> right? Because what's the point? To have an ice cream shot? I don't think so. <laughs> it's a bowl in our house. I confess I've never eaten ice cream out of it. I'm not going to. I'm also not going to show up with a bowl like this. It's an ice cream bowl. It's so cute, isn't it? My wife likes cute things. I'm thankful for that. Um, she's used these to, you know, serve to people because it looks good because it's like an ice cream cone, uh, if you can't see it back there. And, and honestly, I can confess, I've never eaten ice cream out of this. It is way too small. All right, because if I'm going to eat ice cream, honestly, I, I usually use a bowl like this because I can put, like, more than a pint in it. Uh, and and it's, just a, it's just a cheap plastic bowl, so it's not cold when I'm holding it on my hands. And, uh, and so that's my usual ice cream bowl. But you, you invited me to your house and said I could have as much ice cream as I want in one serving. I'm not bringing this bowl. I might bring this bowl. You know, because uh, this is a good-sized bowl. And some of you are like, that's my ice cream bowl right there. Right? Because you could put a lot, you could put almost, you could probably a half gallon in there, you know, and just eat it up good and, and enjoy. But I'm just going to be truthful with you. You're talking about ice cream, you got weird rules, you told me to bring my own bowl, so I'm not going to bring this bowl either. Nope. I am bringing this bowl. And I confess, I have eaten ice cream out of this bowl. 
Not really proud of it, but it's true. So I'll just share that. So this is, I'm going to show up because you got weird rules, and I'm just going to load up, and I'm going to enjoy. Now, you guys are going, that's silly. Who would make those rules, and who would do that? But I, I'm just telling you, that this, I, this makes sense to me when I read this passage because God has said to us, give, and it will be given to you. For with the measure that you use, it's going to be measured to you. Now, what size blessing bowl are you presenting to God in your life? I, I mean, reality. This is crazy, but God has told us we determine the amount of blessing that we want to receive. Give, and it will be given to you. Whoever sows sparingly, well, also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. We determine the amount of blessing. God determines how he's going to deliver that blessing. God determines the type of blessing. He doesn't tell us that we get to sit in an order and say, God, I want money, or God, I want health, or God, I want this. He just says, look, trust me. I know what's best for you, and I'll bless you. I'll bless you. And, and most of us want more blessings. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I want more blessings. I really do. So when God says to me, hey, give and it will be given to you because the measure you use will be measured back to you, I am not showing up with this bowl. <laughs> and, and, and I'll just be really blunt. There's some of you who are showing up with this bowl or smaller, and you're complaining that God's not blessing you enough. And, and you're going, how come I don't have the blessings that, that this guy has? How come? It's not fair, God. Why are you blessing them so much more than me? And God's going, dude, bring a bigger bowl. <laughs> bring a bigger bowl. That, it, you've got the power to bring a bigger bowl. It's all on you. It's not on, it's not on him. God's like, hey, I got blessings, but guess what they're going to do? They're just going to overflow, and you're not going to really enjoy them in this. You're not going to benefit from this. You want more blessings? Bring this. And honestly, this is small. We ought to bring 55-gallon drums, right? Back up a, you know, big old dump truck. Let's fill them up, God. And God's like, I'm good with that. He's not going to run out of blessings. He's God. He's, he wants to bless us, but that means that we have to actually show up with a bigger bowl. I, that's what Jesus said. That's what the Apostle Paul said. And, and it's on, up to you and I to determine what our next step is going to be. By the way, we don't just teach this as a church. We practice this as a church. Uh, let me just tell you how Calvary lives this out. You may or may not know this, but we give 22% of every dollar that you drop in the offering box that isn't designated to something. We give 22% of it away to mission causes. Some of that goes to bless people here in Havasu. Some of it goes to bless people around the world. But, but that means that uh, 22 cents out of every dollar we give away. Uh, that, that, that's because we believe that, you know, if you give generously, you're going to receive generously. In addition to that, <clears throat> you guys give about $50,000 towards benevolence last year, and we gave it away to people who are hurting, to people who need help, to people who are struggling. We've got this great ministry team called Benevolence Team, and, and uh, they get to sit down and talk to people and help people uh, every single week. We're doing that. Plus, last year, we gave a total mission offering uh, for the whole year. Our mission giving exceeded a half a million dollars. Say, so you guys, whether you knew that or not, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, and and, and be, besides impacting the thousands of people that we do in Lake Havasu City and Parker, uh, you guys are impacting people around the world. For instance, for the last several years, in fact, about last three years, we've been contributing both the church and as individuals in the church uh, to wells in Mozambique. They just got hit by this huge cyclone. You didn't hear about it because nobody cares about Mozambique. But God cares. And, and so we've been putting in wells so that people can have clean drinking water year-round. And so far, those wells that have been put in through the dollars that you've given and that we've given have touched over 23,000 people. Amen. See? You're, you're making a difference through generosity. Hey, here, here's, a, here's another thing that's coming up since I'm talking about giving and things like that. Uh, we have partnered with Compassion International, uh, and a lot of you already know them because about a year and a half ago, we sponsored over 200 kids uh, through Compassion, most of them in Honduras. 
because we said, hey, we want to we want to build a compassion center, a church in Honduras that's going to lead people to Jesus and feed kids and educate kids and help their families rise up out of poverty. And and, uh, and we just agreed this month uh, on the location and the partnership that we're going to have with the church that's going to be in that building. And, and so we committed to raise seventy six thousand dollars so that we could build that compassion center. And so uh, I'm just going to tell you, some of, some of you uh, may want to contribute to that. And if so, just designate it Compassion or Honduras, and we will, it will go to help build a building that is going to take care of two to 300 children in Honduras. In addition to that, uh, next fall, or this fall, uh, in about six months, we're going to give you an opportunity to sponsor the kids personally that are going to be at that center that we're building. And then in 2020, we're going to go down there and dedicate the building and see the kids. So isn't that kind of cool? So I believe that God is blessing Calvary by providing the resources because Calvary is both faithful to the mission to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus and we're being generous. And, and so uh, he's given us more influence. He's expanding. He's given us more people. Uh, you guys see that. Uh, and, and so because of that, uh, this might not be a shock to you, but it means we're going to need more space. Yeah. Hey, we're going to need more space. We're already out of space. Uh, I mean, you guys know we started uh, having services at the McCulloch campus because we're out of space here on Sunday morning at Sweetwater. And, and so right now, uh, our immediate need is we need to build a multi-purpose educational space for our kids on the weekend here at Sweetwater for our kids on the weekend and for adult education during the week because uh, there's no space. Two campuses and we're out of space. Uh, not only that, we need to build some office space attached to that because uh, we're hiring people and giving them terrible office situations and going, here, share a room that's the size of a closet. Glad you're here. See, we, we need to build. And, and guess what? Robert mentioned that we've got this great ministry called Calvary Christian Academy. They're out of space too. I mean, we, we've just entered into a, a lease with the Lutheran Church across the highway. I mean, you can see it when you walk out the front doors. We're going to be leasing their school building. They, they haven't had uh, anyone in it for about four years. We're going to be leasing that and have that as our junior high campus. They're out of space. Yeah. And in the next couple of years, we're either going to need to raise money to, to buy a building or build a building for CCA. And, and then uh, guess what? We've got a campus in Parker. Did you guys know that? Of course you did. Parker knows that really well. But, but here's the thing. We had this campus in Parker, and they're going to need space. We've got a little office there. We can't do Celebrate Recovery in that. We can't have adults meet for Bible study. We can't have students uh, ministry during the week. Uh, the only thing you can do is Sunday morning. We're, we're going to have to commit to a space, to you know, buy a space or build a space in Parker, and we need to do that soon. I'm sharing this with you because I want you to know the needs. Right now on this building, we still owe about two and a half million dollars. Now, we've already paid down in less than three years, $500,000 of debt. And, and that's just because people are faithful and generous and are giving to the building fund, uh, even though we're not building anything, so we're just using it to pay down the debt. And, and I share all of that because our goal is to be debt-free and build a building here and, you know, expand the school and build in Parker. And, and I share that knowing that God doesn't need our money knowing that the church doesn't need our money, but knowing that we need to give. So here's the question. What is your next step in giving? What does God want you to do? Now, I'm pretty sure that God desires to bless you more than he's blessing right now. So are you going to upgrade the size of your bowl? That's really what the question is. What's the next step? that God is calling you to make. So we're followers of Jesus. We know the next steps are necessary. So uh, in your bulletins, you got a next steps card. We've been giving you these every week. Uh, we started off with the, the card about what's your next step and being involved in the mission of Christ. And, and we encourage you to invite three people to come uh, attend one of the campuses, one of the services uh, between then and Easter. I hope you're working on that. I hope you're inviting people. If you're here as a guest, guess what? They're, they're being obedient to God by bringing you along with them. Uh, last week, we talked about ways to serve. 
that, that you know, we're going to find joy in serving. And so we challenge you to fill it out and drop it in the offering box or give it to us so that we could uh, contact you about ways that you could serve here at Calvary or in the community. And then this week, this is about you and God. I, I mean, I don't there's notice there's no place to put your name on here. That this isn't a, hey, I'm going to turn this into the church. They're going to come collect bills or anything like that. This is about you and God determining what size bowl you want to bring. And, and here's what I want you to do. I want to challenge you that wherever you are on the, the generosity spectrum, I want to encourage you to take the next step. So on here, it, it says give something. If you've been giving nothing to the ministry of Calvary, I'm gonna, your next step is to give something. You're like, well, I don't know what to give. Well, why don't you pray about it? Why don't you ask God what he would have you to give? It's not my job to tell you. Did you notice verse 7, what Paul said? Each one should decide uh, what he's to give, not grudgingly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. You decide. This is you and God. This is about the size bowl you want to fill up, that you want God to fill up with blessings. So uh, talk about that. So if you're not giving anything, give something. Or, or maybe if you're just giving sporadically, God's saying give regularly. Make it a habit. Start giving weekly or monthly. Saying, God, this is yours. Maybe every time you get paid, you say, hey, God, I'm going to give you a part of that, and I'm going to make it a, a habit in my life so that you can bless me through that habit. Or, or maybe you've been giving regularly, but God's been nudging you about tithing. You go, what's a tithe? Tithe is 10%. That, that's kind of the, the standard mark that the Bible uses to kind of say this is what faithful giving looks like. And so maybe you've been giving regularly, and, and you go, yeah, I, I really could give more. And God's saying, hey, I want you to prioritize that and, and take me seriously that I can provide for you even though you're giving 10% of your income back to me. So maybe uh, God's saying, hey, I want you to begin tithing. And, and then the last one says give generously. And, and you're going, well, yeah, aren't all those generous? I, when I put that on there, I mean like crazy generous. I mean like your friends think you're nuts generous. You go, well, why would I do that? Maybe because God's blessed you like crazy. Maybe you're sitting on resources that God's given you, and you have enough for you and your family, and, and you've never really thought about it, and right now the Holy Spirit's kind of going, hey, you could be that guy. You could be that guy that writes a check and, and, you know, helps us to buy or build a new campus for our school. You could be that person that writes a check and just say, you need 76000 to pay for a church that's going to feed 300 kids uh, long term? I'm in. I'll pay for it. Or maybe you're that person that goes, two and a half million dollars of debt? You know what? God's blessed me. I can do that. I can re remove that debt and unleash those dollars for ministry in this community, in Parker, and to the ends of the earth. I want to be that person. You see, you have to figure out what your next step is in following Jesus. What I know is he's calling every single one of us to take a next step. Some of you are like, I like this sermon before you got to point three. And I really liked it before you got to point four. But I, I, I'm passionate about this because I want us to get it. I, I want us to destroy that obstacle that is preventing us from really following Jesus because this is real. And, and, and some of us are living in this kind of blessings. And I want you to experience so much more. So much more. But I can't control that. You can. So ask yourself this question. What is God calling me to do? What is my next step of generosity? Let's pray. Father, you are good. You have blessed us beyond anything that we deserve. All of the goodness in our life, the love of family and friends, the the houses we live in, the cars we drive, the, the bank accounts that we have. Whether there's a little or a lot, it's all from you. You've given us everything we have, the health we have that we enjoy, the freedom that we are blessed with in this country. Most of all, you have blessed us through Jesus. The fact that you loved us enough to send your one and only Son into this world to be our Savior so that we could be your children, so that we could have eternal life, so that we could be redeemed, it is beyond uh, understanding. And yet you have loved us. And we love you. And you know we love you. So let us hear your voice clearly. I pray that, that everyone in this room would be challenged by your spirit to take the next step that you are calling us to. Uh, we can't do this without you. 
And so we yield to you our minds, our hearts, and our checkbooks. In Jesus' name, amen.